I'm glad, I'm glad they want to get in shape. <laughs> I wonder if they could get, you know, have some Holy Ghost music to get in shape too. <laughs> yeah, we used to go to church. We didn't have to do Zuma classes. We just went to church and danced <laughs> for two hours. Yeah, that's all went out there. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Well, good night. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. We're glad to have you all with us tonight here at Faith and Victory Church. And um, we're going to continue on our series on uh, prayer. And um, trust that you'll get ministered to. We're glad to have you. And we're going to just, uh, to recap, you know, those who hadn't joined with us since before Christmas or those who um, uh, are joining in for maybe for the first time. Uh, we're talking about prayer from Ephesians six eighteen, where it says, praying always with all prayer or all kinds of prayer or all types of prayer and supplication in the spirit. Amen. All right. Praise God. So we talked about that we're, we have uh, the seven kinds of prayer we want to discuss. It's the prayer of faith, which is also, the, that's how we live. We live by faith, right? But the prayer of faith is the prayer of believing. And we, it, it, we said this, it could be better stated the prayer of believing and receiving because all prayer should be prayed in what? Faith. Everything we do should be by faith, right? So, we, we do call it the prayer of faith because uh, it is a model of faith. You believe that you receive, say it with your mouth, amen? But So the prayer of faith is how we live. We live by faith. Um, again, the prayer of believing and receiving would be a more clear uh, description of this prayer, okay? Uh, second is the prayer of binding and loosing, uh, our prayer of authority. We have authority in the earth. Uh, prayer of supplication, praying for, for the saints, intercession, praying for others, thanksgiving. You know, the prayer of thanksgiving. You know, uh, uh, let all your requests uh, be made known to God with thanksgiving. We, we let our, our requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. Amen. We need to be thankful. And uh, the prayer of consecration, dedication. What do we also call this kind of prayer? Call it what? Free prayer. Because we talked about how that... When you're consecrated and dedicated to God, you remove what? You remove pride and selfishness out of prayer. Amen? So even in the prayer of faith, uh, we, we see people get so lifted up with pride or so lifted up with selfishness that they skew things and they begin to try to manipulate things in prayer that make it wrong because their heart's not right before God. In other words, they're not approaching it from the right heart. So when we consecrate and dedicate to God, then when we go, so we call it kind of a pre-prayer. Uh, when, you're, when you're there, when you, even when you're approaching the prayer of faith, you're believing to receive something, you're, you're, you're asking for God's um, import. You're asking for God's, uh, uh, how, how, how can I say this? Not, not blessing because his word is blessed, but for his direction. Remember, I, I've shared with you uh, the thing that, um, that Doug Jones shared with us a number of years ago about going to Brother Hagen and asking him, he said, What's, what has um, being led by the Spirit got to do with uh, faith? And Brother Hagen looked at him across his desk and said, it's got everything to do with it. Of course, we, we don't hear that a lot. He says, why don't, why don't we get that taught? He says, because when I'm in a meeting and we're going to pray for the sick, we're just trying to get as much faith into them as fast as we can to get them healed. But you know, uh, see, we're supposed to be stewards of the whole word, not just a message. The whole counsel. We're not getting so limited on one subject. We don't. We, we don't go anywhere else. Well, I'm a faith person. Well, I'm a spirit person. I'm a word. I, you know. No, we we need to be a whole word person. Okay. You know, that that all produce faith in you. I, I agree with that. Praise the Lord. So, but this pre prayer gets your heart and keeps your heart right because you're consecrated and dedicated to God. So when you go to God and you're believing God for something, he can tell you, no, that's not the right place to go. And then we're over there trying to manipulate and trying to make it happen. I believe that I receive it. I got it right now. And then your pride gets involved when God's trying to tell you, no, that's not the right path. It's not that I don't want you to have something, but this isn't the right path. We need to be going here. Okay? Paul was on his way to preach somewhere, and the Spirit of God told him to go somewhere else. He could say, well, I'm... I'm the man of God. I, I know, I'm going to go preach over there. I've got my faith out there. But the Spirit of God led him in a different direction. And that's when he went over to Ephesus and got thrown in jail. <laughs> you know, I'll never get thrown in jail as a missionary. My faith, well, I'm going to tell you what. Just if, go ahead, stupid. <laughs> go ahead.
go ahead and act like that. You're going to get yourself in trouble. So, and then we started talking about last week, the prayer we, we, <clears throat> we call praise, pr worship, adoration. And uh, we, we kind of categorize these. The prayer of faith or believing and receiving is how we live. Prayer binding illusion is authority prayer. A supplication is for you know, is, is saints and intercession for others is still outside of us. Thanksgiving is a heart prayer. Okay? And, and consecration, dedication. These are heart prayers. These are, these are, these are attitudes of your heart. And I'm going to tell you something. One of the things that we kind of missed in the Word of Faith charismatic circles was heart. Not everybody, but there, were, there, there tended to be a, a, an arrogance about our knowledge of the Word to where we got to, we were so cocky about us that we lost our heart before God. And we've got to keep our heart right before God. We've got to be thankful. We can't be, hey, look, my faith got me this. Now, let's just let's chill. And in the end, God's still the provider. Okay? He is still Jehovah Jireh. He is the Lord that makes provision. Okay? And he's, and, 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 and well, I use my faith, and he dealt to you that measure of faith. Okay? And then, well, I grew it because the Word of God grows it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In other words, you can't ever take credit. So don't get cocky. Remember that scene in Star Wars where, where Luke goes down there and shoots one of the pod fighters from the Empire and goes, hey, I got one. And, and uh, Sol Solo goes, great kid, don't get cocky. <laughs> you know, don't, don't get all lifted up, okay? And so these are heart prayers. And then praise, worship, and adoration. This is, of all the prayers, the one where it becomes solely, totally God-focused. We have to get out of ourselves and get focused on Him, His glory, His majesty, His magnificence, His, His greatness. I mean, we, I think of the old hymn, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And I love all of our charismatic courses, but I'm going to tell you, there's some, there's some hymns that are just so God-focused and God-centered that it just, it, 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 it bids the heart to rejoice in how wonderful God is. Amen? Amen? All right. Praise God. Hey, Tommy. All right. And so um, we're talking about praise, worship, and adoration. We, we started last week on the, on the seven. So let's move back over. We've got another list of sevens here. Um, they're in the Old Testament, I do not have another sheet. <laughs> okay, all righty. And so we started last week with these seven different Hebrew words. And I, I'm not going to write all the definitions because y'all all now have at least one, one between y'all, one copy of this. Uh, the se seven Hebrew words of, of, uh, for, for uh, praise. Now, I was, I was teaching my, um, um, I am the permanent guest speaker for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at my, my school, all right? Because I am the staff advisor, and they, the student advisor has asked me, unless they get somebody else to come in for something different, I am the ongoing permanent guest speaker for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Okay? Okay? So I get to teach them. I get to do a Bible study with them. Okay? And I teach, this is what I'm teaching them. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And so we're talking about how that, you know, in the Bible, we, we know that the Bible was written in Old Testament. We wrote it. It was written in uh, Greek. I mean, I'm not Greek, but Hebrew. And some Chaldean, okay, not not uh, not a lot, but some Chaldean, but prim primarily Hebrew. New Testament was written in Greek, and uh, some Aramaic, some not, you know, not a lot, but some. There's there's some in there, okay, uh, but primarily Greek. And then then when they translated the Old Testament, uh, I forgot what year they did it, but it, you know, somewhere between five hundred and 
1,000 B.C. I don't know the exact time frame, but somewhere. They translated the Old Testament into Greek because Greek, you know, the Roman Empire had taken the world. And so they trans and that's called the Septuagint. I can't remember how to spell that, except two again. Okay. And, um, and you'll see that sometimes in places that's referred to as SCPT. That's the except two again. That is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, when they did that, they would take, they would take a Greek word, and then they would go, and all these Hebrew words, you might have six different Hebrew words that they use one Greek word to translate. Okay. For, for whatever, you know, they'd have, they didn't have a Greek equivalent necessarily, so they would use the same Greek word over and over. Or, and, and, and in some cases, in, in these seven words for praise, we have that. We have one Greek word that we translate what? Praise. Now, sometimes they use different ones. But, so we, we, got, we got our word praise that ends up being the English equivalent to the Greek word they use to translate all these seven Hebrew words. Okay? So we hear, we go, you know, praise you the Lord. And we think, well, glory to God. Yet, when they heard it in Hebrew, originally heard it, they heard something more specific. There was more speci a more specific meaning to a particular word than just praise the Lord. Because then when we just kind of say praise the Lord, a lot of times what we end up with is we end up with whatever our concept of praising God, what is praise. And, you know, it depends on what kind of church you're in. Let's be real honest. Okay, if you're in a liturgical church and they say praise the Lord, they think that they're taking communion or the Holy Eucharist and they praise the Lord. They don't say amen. Okay, it's quieter than a church mouse. All right, or, or, or they're in the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church, they're reading from the, the Book of Common Prayer and they'll say, you know, and they'll read, do responsive readings and, they, and the congregation goes, thank you, Lord Christ. And that's their praise in the Lord. Okay, you come over among uh, you know, our, our um, evangelical churches, and you might at a, at a uh, singing, you know, a, a gospel quartet singing, get somebody get the shout and say, hallelujah, but not during church. You get up on our charismatics and, um, you know, uh, Pentecostals, and, you know, and, and then they, they, they praising God is, 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 you know, whatever. You're wide open, shouting, running, dancing, all of it, okay? Um, and so, Whatever your concept is, is going to have to govern when you hear, see in the scripture, praise you the Lord, or praise the Lord. However, because there's different words in the Hebrew, and they had different meanings, and when we study this, that helps us understand how praise is, that when, we're, when we say praise the Lord, uh, halal, ye the Lord, you know, that means to be clear, to praise, to boast, to shine, to rave, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish, okay, in our praises to God. So halal, remember halal is the root, root of what word? Hallelujah. Why? Because hallelujah, um, yeah, is what? It is the root or the, you know. Okay, of the unpronounceable Hebrew word Y H W H, which is we we call it a lot of times. You'll hear people say his name is what Yahweh. Okay, see the letters. All right, but this is also where they get the name Jehovah from. Why? Because in German, in the German influence of translations, the J and the Y, you don't have a Y, you don't have J in Hebrew. So they used, because of the German translators, they used a J. They put the E, they put a, you know, the H. I left out the, there we go, Yahweh. I left out the H in here. Yeah, you know, the H, and then they put an O, and then V. German has V for W. Okay? And then A-H. So Yahweh and Jehovah are the same word. Okay? You know, we, we, we got along in the charismatic movie. We thought Yahweh was more spiritual. It's the same thing as Jehovah. It's no different. Okay? Yeah, I'm more spiritual because you say Yahweh. None of us can say that word. <laughs> the, the Hebrews forgot how to say it. Because when they translated scriptures, and remember the scribes would take the scriptures and keep copying them, okay? And when they got to this word right here, 
they would get up, go and cleanse themselves, strip their clothes and cleanse themselves because it was so holy. They, they felt that they felt like they could, you know, it was so holy, the, the name of God, that they would not say it. And so they forgot how to pronounce it because it was too holy. That, that, that's, you know, that's, don't mean that they should have done that, but that's what they did. It was so holy. So they forgot how to pronounce it. They don't know how to pronounce it. So we had to add vowels in our language to be able to say this. Okay. In your Bible, King James particularly, you'll see it with the small caps, what they call small caps. That's this word. Anytime in the Old Testament you see this instead of this, Okay, when you see that, it's this. It's the Y-H-W-H. And when you see, um, I'm not going to put all of them up here, okay? But, but Jehovah Nisi or Yahweh Nisi, Rapha. Okay, there you go. So that's, that's three, four, five. That's five of them. Okay, I won't. All right. Um, Jehovah Nisi. Je so it was, it was this, this is exactly what it was in Hebrew. We had the YHWH, and then we had the compound. Okay? All right. So, um, halal, halal to Yahweh. Rave, boast, be clamorously foolish. And your adoration of, and, and Schofield says that Jehovah, yeah, this, this right here, is the ever increasing self revelation of the name of the covenant keeping God. It's God, that's, that's, this is a covenant name. This is the name of the covenant. The hyphens, it's an ever-increasing self-revelation. I love this, self-revelation. Every time God said, I am Jehovah Nisi, I am Jehovah Rapha, I am Jehovah Jireh, I am Jehovah Tzidkenu, I am Jehovah Shalom, uh, I am Jehovah Shama. Okay, that's another one. And I know I've left one out. I'm, I'm right off the bat. I can't think of what it is right the second. Okay? If you think of it, let me know. Um, he was revealing more of who the covenant God is. See? I am the Lord, Jehovah, that keepeth covenant. What does that mean? When he began over time, what's the very first one he does? Anybody remember? Exodus 15, 30, uh, 16, 36. What, what is it? 15. Mm -hmm. The very first one that he gave is I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. I said, none of these, these diseases that fill in the, uh, the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the covenant God, and I reveal myself as your healer. Okay? He revealed himself as Jehovah Jireh. Revealed himself as Jehovah to Sid Kenya. Jehovah Shalom, Lord our peace. Um, the Lord Nisi, Nisi is the ban his banner over us as victory. Um, the Lord our righteousness. Okay, is Jehovah to Sid Kenya. Shama, um, I believe the Lord is there. All right. And I'm just trying to think which one I'm missing. I know I'm missing one. I just can't think of what it is right off the top of my bat head here. Because um, that was not my plan. <laughs> I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't doing any of that. All right. But. We got the halal, and we, you know, so last week we kind of introduced this. I'm just, I mean, I'm backing up a little bit. So he says here, um, to be clear, to be praised, to shine, to boast, to show, to rave, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. Every time the word hallelujah is spoken, and did you know, other than one alternate spelling of alleluia, same basically this with just an A in front of it, this is universal. 
you go, I go, I've been overseas, I've been in other countries preaching and, and having interpreters. And when you get to the word hallelujah, it's still hallelujah. There's not another word for this. They don't have a different word. So I, was, I remember first, my first mission trip, I was in the Dominican Republic, you know, and I don't speak Spanish, but I, I learned enough stuff to say, Jesus Cristo es el Señor. Gloria a Dios. Amen. Hallelujah. And they go, hallelujah, because <laughs> it's the same word. It's the same word. I've been in France, you know, and, um, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, a, 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 a zoo, uh, um, Señor, Señor, it's, it's S-E-G, it's Señor. It's, it's, a, it's not Señor, but it's, it's, it's similar. French, North Spanish have a word for Lord. So what they usually do is they'll put the word, the article, the in front of sir, and it's the sir. Okay, so in Spanish he is el señor, the sir. Okay, now that's how they translate Lord, because they don't have a word that directly translates Lord. So we, they call him the sir. Okay, so I, I, I just go, Jesus Cristo es el señor de sonore, see? See, <laughs> glory to God, hallelujah. But you go anywhere and you preach, and when they, you say hallelujah, they'll say hallelujah. And what you're saying is, what, <clears throat> what you are really saying is rave, boast, celebrate, amen? Um, be clamorously foolish in your adoration of Yahweh, of the covenant God. Hallelujah is not just a sermon uh, agreement word. Think about it, you know. We say amen or hallelujah, you know. But if we understand what the word means, we're saying something a little bit deeper. Amen? M. Kadesh, yep. The Lord, what? Yeah, okay. Yahweh, M. Kadesh, M. Yeah, let's see. Um, I probably just bit miss. Okay, okay. K A D D E. Okay, all right. And so when we come to church, we say, Hallelujah! Stop. Now let's think about that. So we're talking about the prayer of praise, worship, and adoration. Hello. Hallelujah, everybody. Let's just rave. Let's boast. Let's celebrate. Amen. Let's shine. Let's be very clear. Okay? And even clamorously foolish about our celebration and our love and our recognition of the greatness of our covenant-keeping God. Now, remember when Jesus told the man and said, <clears throat> don't tell anybody what happened? Okay? He went out and published it everywhere. Remember, John, Don Francisco wrote a song a number of years ago, I got to tell somebody. He said, but I got to tell somebody. <laughs> I got to tell somebody. You know, you got that, 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 that kind of choir church song, um, I want to testify. Okay? You know, yeah, I grew up Pentecostal. And on Wednesday nights, after the end of the service, we all had to, te you know, uh, well, we had prayer, but we always had, we had, we had, on Wednesday nights, we had to testify. We had testimony means no matter what was going on, you had to testify, and you had to go down to the altar. That's how we did it, okay? But our testimony meetings kind of went like this. And you see, if you've been around some of these churches, you know what we talk about. I want to thank the Lord I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold true to the end. And they'd sit back down. Well, I'm glad you're saved. I'm glad you're sanctified. I'm glad you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I messed them up. Because I got out there and I left out. I, I want to thank the Lord I'm saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm going on to the end. Because, you know, being Pentecostal holiness, we believe the sanctification is a second definite work of grace. And you had to be sanctified before you got filled with the Holy Ghost. That, that, was, that was church doctrine. And um, 
You know, I believe that you know, you're sanctified spiritually in Christ, but the sanctification process of your body and your mind goes on while you're here on this earth. That's an ongoing work. It, it just goes on and on and on <laughs> and on. And you think by the time you think you got it, you find out there's more that's got to be gotten. Okay? Hallelujah. And you know, then we go down to the altar. Well, this is talking about hallelujah. We begin to tell, you know, when you're praising and worshiping and celebrating God, you're testifying. You're testifying to everybody that God is awesome. He's been awesome to me. And I'm so grateful and thankful. I just got to tell, so I got to shout about it. I got to boast about it. I got to not boast about you. You're boasting about God. <clears throat> Amen. Boast about how great he is. They even got, they wrote a song a number of years ago. It's an old hymn. Some of you have heard it, some of you may not have. Old for a thousand tongues to sing. Think about that. The, the, the writer of that, that hymn just said, and I, I don't know if they were filled with the Holy Ghost or not. We figured out how to do it. Get filled with the Holy Ghost to speak in tongues. Then, then you can have a thousand tongues to sing. Okay? But, you know, their, their heart was so overwhelmed with the desire to praise and magnify God. They said, if I just had a thousand tongues to be able to sing about his greatness. Yeah. This is where we're talking about halal. Halal. Hallelujah. Halal. So we want to be able to be, be have halal to God. So we can't shut our churches down and say, we don't, that, that's, we don't do that in our church. You better. You better let the people loose. They need, see, the heart needs to be able to express how great he is. And when we repress that, we rob them of a communication about God that they need. Because it does something to us to be able to magnify God. What happens when we magnify something? Anything. Oh, <laughs> I can see that. It's been magnified. Okay? It's magnified. It's bigger. It's clearer. What happens when we magnify God, when we boast about God? He becomes bigger. He becomes clearer. Amen? So we can't rob the people, people of the heart need to halal Yahweh. Because if we don't halal Yahweh and we repress, I mean, ministers, we, we should be ashamed of themselves because they, they buy into some denomination or whatever or some church cultural thing where they stop people from engaging in what the Scriptures tell them to do. Because Psalm, and, and there's others, but I just, you know, we got a list of them here. But Psalm 113, 1 through 3 says, Halal ye Yahweh, ye the Lord. Praise halal all ye servants of the Lord. Praise or halal the name of the Lord. They are told, the scripture commands us to be, to rave, to boast, to celebrate the Lord. Ye servants of the Lord, you're to rave, to shine, to praise, to boast the Lord. Amen? So the scripture is, 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 is a command for people. I mean, Psalm 151, halal the Lord. Halal God in his sanctuary. Halal him in his mighty expanse. Let me, let me put that into modern day English for you. Uh, halal him everywhere. His mighty expanse is everywhere. Amen? Not just when you got a Holy Ghost service. Not just when they got the Hammond B3 with the Leslie going and they got it, you know, and they're and they're they're hitting it, you know, and they got the, you know, they're, they're hitting just that right beat, you know, and you're, you know, everybody gets all stirred up. Love that, by the way. And just, I mean, that, that's, that's when we start having church, all right? We get out of church and have church, all right? And there's not, a, not, not everybody can play a ham and be three with a Leslie, all right? I mean, that, that, that's somebody, there, there, there are people who are just anointed to do that, okay? And um, C3 or a B3, the, the, the one without the covering around it is the B3, the one that's covered is, and the one that's covered is a B, a C3 because it's a church. It's a church version of the B3, okay? Because it's got the, the privacy skirt built in. 
That's, that's the only difference between the two is, is the uh, cabinet. All right? Um, and so, you know, uh, Psalm 149.3, let them halal his name in the dance. Be clamorously foolish in praising the name of the Lord in the dance. Now, people come along, you know, and they get all stuffy shirted and they want to they want to stop people and say, that's just, that's just, we don't, we don't do that in our church. That's just carnal. That's not God. Yet they were commanded to in the Old Testament. Way before you ever showed up, buddy. Are you here? Way before you ever got your PhD. Amen. <coughs> Way before anybody <coughs> that you study under ever showed up. And what did, the, what, did, what did the writer of the New Testament say? Holy men of old wrote as they were moved upon by the Spirit. The Spirit moved upon David or he moved upon the psalmist to write these things. And say, hello. Be clamorously foolish the name, towards the name of the Lord. Then dance. Let them sing praises with the timbrel and the harp. I remember a number of years ago, we had one of the most major evangelical evangelists in America who was not spirit-filled, but you know, he, he got a lot of people saved. But he would go into church, he would go in there and get on the, uh, some of the kind of charismatic television pro programs and, th and preach about the, uh, the, the drums. I mean, that's right after they had service where they played the drums. He'd be a guest speaker. He'd talk about how they were of the devil. Really? Did y'all know back in 19, around 1917 or 1918, there was a huge controversy in the Pentecostal churches called the Great Necktie Issue? And it was, it was this. They would say, I'd rather have a snake tied around my neck than to wear one of them neckties because they're of the devil. They're world. They represented worldliness. Now, we got to wear, if you don't wear the necktie, you're acting just like the world. <laughs> goes around, comes around, goes in cycles. All right. Now, all right, so I'm looking for space. Okay. Y'all don't need to have the, 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 the um, y'all got that, right? You understand the reason why we translate and get the different ones. Okay. So, so this is, this is the highest form of spoken phrase. Now, I'm going to jump. I'm going to go ahead and jump all the way down to number. Seven, because tehillah is really the companion word to halal. All right? It means to sing halal. To sing or to laud. For, for, uh, proceed to involve music, especially singing hymns of the Spirit or praise. Now, so, in our, in our, um, in our charismatic circles, we, we kind of became to understand that, you know, what, this, this is probably manifest more often in singing and tongues. Singing in the Spirit. Now take people who don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you'll freak them out and start singing in the Spirit. Okay? They do. They just kind of, if if they're real hardcore in with their denomination, a lot of times, which what you'll have happen is, they'll go, "Oh, is that what that was? That was beautiful." You know, um, I think you get people around the Spirit of God without them really realizing what what's going on, and because their spirit, soul, and body, their spirit, it'll touch them, it'll move them. Okay, so Tahila is. Rooted in halal. This, this word comes out of that word. Okay? But it's singing. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I miss because I, I don't think we have enough manifestation of it in the church today. Um, but, I, you know, I, I got born again and came up in, in right smack dab in the middle of the charismatic renewal. Okay? And you'd have 10,000 people fill an auditorium and get to singing in the spirit. And would sing 20, 30 minutes. 
You didn't get tired after three. Okay. And I've I've heard I mean I've heard it and I've and I've, I've you know you go back and you can find old recordings of it sometimes. It's like their voices become blended as one in this new this and I don't know how to say I'm not a musician, but I always describe it as this it's like another octave comes up over top of it. And it's like you can hear them down here, but this other octave comes up. And there's just it's just the presence of God just descended. And he says, I inhabit. Praises, but you know what kind of praises he inhabits? That's the word. He doesn't, it's not that he doesn't, he doesn't enjoy Barak or Shabbat or Samir, but when he says, I inhabit the praises of my people, this is the word. The Tehillah. I inhabit the Tehillah of my people. And I've experienced, been in it, been, partake, been a partaker, where that's going on. And the presence of God. We got God in us. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. But you know, he's still manifest outside of being in you. Okay? Again, that's that, that pride zone. Get out of that pride zone. Singing in the Spirit, which would be very foolish to a lot of people. Why are you, why are you singing in some language you don't even understand and how you know what you're saying? When I, when I, when I pray in a new tongue, my spirit prayeth. How be it my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding. We sit there and we sing sometimes 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half back, especially back on that day. All these songs we understood. Amen? We did. And a lot, you know, a lot of our charismatic courses that were about what we could do in Christ. You know, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Hallelujah. Amen? You know, a lot of David Engel stuff. You know, I am he, I am whole, from the top of my head to the soles to the tip of my toes. That's all good stuff. That's all reminding us of who we are and what we have in Christ. Okay. Then we could, we would sing songs about, you know, we would sing How Great Thou Art. We would sing, you know, um, I, will try, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider has thrown into the sea. You know, we'd sing all, we sing with our understanding. But Paul said, I'll sing with the Spirit, too. I'll do both. And there's something about here. Why? Because the mind gets out of the way when you start singing in the Spirit. And your spirit becomes uninhibited with your searching for the right words to express what your heart feels or your heart wants to express. Your spirit becomes liberated. Like, this, like I said earlier, the old hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. When we begin to sing in the spirit, suddenly the mind is bypassed. The heart expresses openly its desire to what it wants to express. When you get 10,000 people that or 2,000 people that or 500 or whatever, all at one time, Sister Wilkerson, Jean Wilkerson, um, I've got an old, old tape from Ramo years ago, and she was prophesying. She's one of the few. She she was one of the few people. Brother Hagin said he'd had thousands and ten, over his lifetime, ten thousand, thousands, tens of thousands of prophecies about things to do, and he said one of the only people who was ever accurate was Sister Wilkerson. And I, I've got an old uh, old tape somewhere. I can't. I've looked for it for years. I heard it one time, and I, and, and I it got this place. I have. I can't. But she was talking about. And she began to prophesy, and she began to say, atmosphere calleth me. Now, if you know what she sounded like, you ever heard Billy Brim? That, huh, and all that kind of happened. That all came from, she used to sit at Sister Wilkerson's feet. She would sit under her ministry. And so all those mannerisms and stuff that she has, that's directly, that's Sister Wilkerson. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, it's not her own, it's Sister Wilkerson. I mean, straight up and down. 
because you know <clears throat> she sat under her at her feet, not just under, but at her feet, in that spirit kind of thing. Okay, and um, she says, "Atmosphere calleth me. It calleth me." Then she went on and said this. She said, "Whether for good or evil, it calleth me." <clears throat> now the prophecy goes on and says some other things, but that part has always stuck with me. The evil summons him for to rectify and to bring judgment and to correct, but good calls him for his presence. You see, we get together and we get our minds out of the way. We begin to sing in the spirit. We begin to lay aside the thoughts and the weights of a day or of a week or of a season we're going through. Because we can go through seasons. Sometimes it's not just a day. It's, you know, <clears throat> how many of you ever feel like Lamb Chop song? Remember that song? This is a song that never ends. It just goes on and on. My friend, remember, anybody remember that off the PBS channel? You know, y'all don't remember Lamb Chop? Oh, my goodness. Y'all remember Lamb Chops? Okay. It was, it was a kid's show. And she every show ended with her and her little puppet. And this is the song that never ends. This is a song that never ends. It just goes on and on, my friend. Better Dane? Lamb Chop is a puppet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm Someone started singing, not, not knowing what it was, and they'll continue singing it forever just because this is a song that never. Sometimes we have, we have seasons like that, and you think it's never going to end. You think all the stuff and all the rotten stuff and all the bad stuff you're going through, it's just ne it just looks like it ain't going to ever end. But get over here. And the mind gets out of the way. And the whatabouts and the what ifs and the shoulda, coulda, wouldas and all that stuff gets put on the shelf. And your heart begins to magnify and to rave and to boast in singing form. And I can tell you that when the Spirit of God comes and inhabits the praises of His people, His presence eradicates it eradicates worry, it eradicates fear, it eradicates doubt because the Most High has manifest Himself. The glory of the Lord. Remember, He's a smoking fire and a burning furnace consumed with His power and His glory. All the junk. And, I, and in that place, in that and in that moment, in that time, and in that place, something takes place in the heart of man. You can't explain it. You can't even articulate it. That's why you got to sing in tongues. Because it's beyond the comprehension of the mind. And it's transformative. Oh, that we would have more times and seasons that's like this. Instead of some of this syrupy uh, backwood, back, backwood, backstreet boys worship. Okay? You know, all this breathy, you know, um, whatever. We can have encounters with God and getting into to heal us with God. One of our dear friends, the ministers, the ministers of our church, um, just wrote. Does anybody have any songs they know of? You know, <coughs> modern songs that, that are, what, what, worship God. Right, worship Him, not just talk about Him. This is where we get in the Tehillah, and starting with Halal, but then we move into Tehillah. This is where we get, because we're worshiping Him. We're consumed with him. We're consumed with his presence. And that's why, that's why we kind of named this, instead of just praise, worship, adoration. And we kind of traditionally the, the, the assign praise as fast songs, worship as slow songs. You know what I'm saying? That's not true. Okay, you can have praise songs that are slow and worship songs that are fast. All right? This, the tempo is, is not the determining factor. It's where your heart is and what you're doing in your heart and taking place in your heart that determines 
whether it's a praise or a worship or it's, it's, it's intimate or you're talking about him and you're just, you know, you know this, or you in communion and heart, heart, spirit to spirit. I'm, you know, they, they, we worship him in spirit and in truth. We worship him spirit to spirit. He's the father of spirits. So when we get to, to the Tehillah, when we get to this place, we get out of ourselves. We get into his presence. We get into his glory. We get into to the anointing of God where Wigglesworth said he'd rather spend five minutes in the presence of God than a lifetime without it. Now, a number of years ago, it came, it came out when before Star Trek. It was the Star Trek changeover from the old Enterprise crew of you know Kirk and Spock to the new crew with the card and all them. <clears throat> they called it Generations. And, and, and in the movie, there was a thing called the Nebula. And some guy got caught up in it but got taken back out of it. He spent his whole life trying to get back. Because that one moment in that, in that science, science fiction thing, he couldn't, he couldn't live. Everything he did the rest of his life was try to get back into that. And I'm telling you, that's just an allegory of the presence of God. The world doesn't get, they, they, they're, they're coming up with some kind of science, science fiction kind of thing. But I'm telling you, the presence of God is one of those places you want to be. And I've been, I, I've been in services in my life where you didn't ever want to leave. <laughs> the presence of God was so sweet and so precious. And you had been in the Tehillahs with God. <clears throat> you just kind of wanted to sit there forever. As they're turning the lights out and locking the doors. Saying, we'll see you Sunday. <laughs> you know, you just didn't want to leave. That's the way it should be. You look forward. Amen? To the coming side and spending time in that place. Oh yeah, you're going to Barak, you're going to bow, you're going to, sh you're going to Shabbat, you're going to have Zamar, but you ultimately want to get here. You look forward to those, those times. Spiritual intimacy with God. In his holy presence. Then it's cleansing. It's restoring. It's restorative. It's uplifting. It's separating. It's, it's a sanctifying presence. How we long. How, how your heart does, even though sometimes your head ain't figured it out. How your heart longs. When we get busy with life, we get busy, you know. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the big things, you know, that, I'm, that I am, am ready to see us get back into a permanent location again is we get so time limited here. We have, you know, we have a set amount of time. We've got to get in and out. We've got to get broke down. We've got to get out of here, that kind of stuff. But we don't have time here to do this kind of corporately. We, don't have, we, don't have, we can't practice this because we've got, we got to get out. got to be out by 1 o'clock or so. Then you got to be out by 8 o'clock on Wednesday. Da, 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 I gotta break everything down. And there's just this pressure, this time pressure where you don't really have the, the freedom to let's just let's just wait. Let's just stay. I want to get there. I want to get back where we have our own place again so we can go and we can sit and we can wait and we can spend time with the Lord. Amen. Now the, the other building we've been, I know we you know they, a guy didn't want he wouldn't resign our lease, we had to leave. And the time, the years that we were there, I am telling you, we had some services in that building that I'm talking about. You could, you could just, you could, as you say, cut the atmosphere with a knife. It was so thick with the presence of God. Such marvelous times in His presence. We want to be in the Tehillah. We have the Tehillahs of God manifest. Can you say amen? We want to experience that on a regular basis. 
like I said, the big cares back heyday where you had the big auditoriums. Now we're <coughs> and this is where now I just want to I take a small bit. This is where I I kind of want to I, I say the things I say about you know the light shows and the fog machines and you know the 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 uh, new style of what is and and all that kind of stuff. People are so caught up with the performance of worship. They're not engaging in worship. Oh, man, that was rocking. You know, did you see? I mean, that light show was awesome. Oh, the fog, they got a fog show in the, in the middle of the worship service. And, and that's not going to send you to hell, okay? But how would you know the difference between that and the glory? I've seen the glory. And there wasn't a fog machine going off in the building. Okay? Sometimes we, we get so caught up with the experience of, of the performance. And let me say, so a lot of what's going on now is performance. That we're not, we're not going here anymore. But everybody walks out, and I think they get cheated because they walk out thinking, that was great worship. Did you actually engage in worship? Did you get there? Or did you enjoy the show? Now, Satan will sell us a bill of goods to keep us out of there. Because he knows if we start, we get in here, stuff happens. God talks to you. You can be in his presence. Him, he'll drop something in you that will totally change your life forever. He'll give you direction. He'll give you understanding. He'll illuminate things to you. I am telling you here, what, in his presence is the fullness of joy. Amen? I'm sorry, somebody just sent me something. I was trying to read it, but it didn't, it didn't come back up. Hold on here. Mega churches are now calling their worship services, uh, their church services, worship experiences. The only thing is, sometimes I look at what they're doing, I'm thinking, where's the experience? You know, it's, it's not just about you got entertained. See, if I want to get entertained, I'm going to go to the Palladium after church. I'm going to get me a, a Coke Zero and a bag of popcorn, and I'm going to pay $15 for a movie. Entertain me. I don't want to come to church to be entertained. Okay? I want to come into a place where I, as we corporately come together and our hearts are one with God that his presence manifests itself and we experience him. And when I walk away, I'm not talking about how rocking the worship leader was with their holes in their jeans and their bedhead and their skinny jeans and their, you know, their, or their, their new, it's not, it's not bedhead anymore. It's shaved on the side and the flipping top for guys, you know, they, they, all these new hairstyles, you know, in the long tunic shirts for guys, they look like girls in them. And man buns. You know, and, and we're all caught, and, and, and our people on the platform are so caught up with how they look for their performance. That God's not being manifest. Because we're not getting here anymore. We're not getting into the singing halal. We're not getting to where the heart becomes uninhibited in worshiping God. And we have to get back to that. You need it. I need it. The church needs it. We need to have that intimacy individually and corporately. Amen. So that our lives can be changed. I saw one of my, saw one of my uh, friends got, got on here tonight. Hey, Doug. Doug was at my wedding. <laughs> Went to high school with him. He worked, worked at Parker's together. He knows, he knows how to do barbecue. Um, he, he joined us tonight. So if you're still there, hey, bud. Um, <clears throat> being with God is 
transformative. I, was, I, was, I was, I knew I was, I, was, I kind of had to check back at what I was about to say. You know, the people would shout to God and stuff. When Moses went to the mount and got into the presence of God, and you can think about this, he's not born again. He does not have the life of God in him yet. That doesn't take place until Jesus comes and goes and, goes and preaches to the captives and they're all raised up with him. Just being in the presence of God, his face shone so bright they had to put a veil over it. <laughs> Just got into the presence of God and it made his face shine. They could not look at it. They had to cover it. And here's a man who's not born again. He's not filled with the Holy Ghost. He's an Old Testament covenant man walking out of covenant in obedience to God, looking forward to the coming day of Jesus. And the, and, and the Bible tells us in the Hebrews that they all look for our day. They look for the day that we just didn't get the Holy Ghost to, that would come upon us, that would take up resonance in us. He would abide in us. Now think about the Spirit abiding in us and then we are in His manifest presence. We should be shining. One time Wigglesworth was on a train in uh, England and an Anglican priest came. You know, now you understand the Episcopal Church of America and the Anglican Church of, of England are the same thing. They call, it the, they call it the Anglican Communion. That's how they refer to the Episcopal Church or Anglican Church. You know, we have the African Communion, you have the American Communion, and they're there, but the Anglican Church is the head of all of it in England. Okay, that's the Church of England. All right, and um, so the Anglican priest came on a train and sat down. You know, they traveled by train mostly. Ship, plane, they didn't have planes. All right, so they traveled by train. Uh, and an Anglican priest came and sat down beside Wigglesworth on the train and sat there for a minute or two. And finally, he and Wigglesworth didn't say anything to him, not a word, just sat there. And the man jumps up after a few minutes. Looks at him and says, my God, man, you convict me of sin. And ran out to the car to another car. What's happening? We know we're supposed to spend time with the Lord. <laughs> Les Summerall went to visit him one time. Had a newspaper under his arm. If you don't know this, Fellow Summerall was in England before the war, before the Second World War. And had to leave. When the war broke out, he had to leave and come back to America. All, all passports and, and uh, visas were, were revoked. He had to leave. And... Um, so he went to see Brothers Wiggle. You know, he would go, but he'd, he'd gone to see Brothers Wiggle, but Wigglesworth on that last day, and that's where the prophecy took place um, that he shares later on in life. But he, he went one time, Lord, he, he told him, come back tomorrow, let's pray. This is back early when he first met him. And he shows up at the house, he's got a newspaper in his arm. You know? Brother Summerall was, was a keeper of world events. He liked, you know, even in his later life, he kept at world events, and, you know, he, he wrote a book in the early 80s on jihad, the coming holy war, about Islam. He wrote that 30-plus years ago. About what we're seeing right now, he had prophesied that before he even died. I mean, but it took place after he died. This book was written decades ago. But he shows up at Brother Wigglesworth with a newspaper under his arm, and he comes to the door and says, you, young man, can come in. But that thing stays outside. <laughs> the newspaper. And they went in, and they prayed. They didn't talk. They didn't fellowship. They didn't chit chat, drink tea, you know. Let's have a ladies' fellowship. Well, what are we cooking? And that's fine. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying. And they prayed. And when they got done, Brother Wigglesworth got up, looked at him, said, "I'll see you tomorrow," and left the room. <coughs> that's why he raised the dead twenty six times. That's why he had the impact on the world that he had. Okay? Because he understood that without getting into the presence of God. And of course, now you see, he gets on a train and people get convicted of sin just by sitting by him. Because he would go spend time in God's presence. He would spend time with God. He didn't have to get up and preach at him and you dirty, rotten dog sinner, you're going to hell, get saved. The glory was there. 
Amen. Hallelujah. <coughs> All right. Well, we got to quit. Um, we're running. We want to send in the, the, the uh, brute squad to run us out. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you all for joining us this week. Um, uh, just a reminder for those of you, uh, if you're watching for the first time since Sunday, we, we're, we've started a campaign um, to uh, eliminate the church debt. We've got, we got a little debt left here. Um, we, we have a means of paying it off in um, uh, about 18 months. If um, you know, we, The Lord showed me so if we get 10 people to commit to $100 a month for one year, one 12-month period, and or the <coughs> one-time gifts of $1,200 will be paid out. We'll be out of debt in 18 months, you know. And um, we got right at seven people Sunday. Okay, so eight, okay, nine. Just need one more. All right. So if you're out there and want to join up with us, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, you can give. You can give. Uh, through uh, PayPal or Square Cash on the internet, and of course we know y'all y'all know you can give check cash whatever. <clears throat> um, we're I mean just think about it. We could be we could debt free, and then that that will free us up to go get another building. And um, I'm just looking forward to being have that that removed so we can f function more freely and openly. We've been working towards paying it down, and the Lord spoke to me before Christmas and said go add it up. So I went and added up the debt. He said, if you get 10 people to give an extra $100 a month or, or, or people to partner with you for $100 a month for, for one year, it's not a lifetime commitment. We're not asking people to give forever. It'd be done, it'd be done in less than 18 months. And, of course, we can, then you go, if we got 20, it'd be done in nine months. <laughs> you, you start thinking, man, this thing could just roller coaster. Yeah, okay? <clears throat> but we're going to take, we've taken that step. So we're now at nine. That's, that's, uh, that's amazing and exciting. Amen. So we're excited about that. Amen. Um, if you need an offering of it to give tonight, raise your hand. If you're not, that's fine. Um, praise the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for, for the word of God. Thank you for the tithe. Thank you for the offering. Thank you for those who've committed and, and, and are joining up with us for debt reduction. And we just thank you. You bless them according to your holy word. And we call us liberated financially and free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. God bless you as you give. And uh, we're excited. And uh, B, we're so glad to have you tonight. We hope you got blessed. We'd love to see you again Sunday morning at 10. We, we're supposed to start at 1030, but because we have to come in and set up, there's just no way to get it done at 1030. So it's more like closer to 11 that we actually get started. Just they, they, can't, they, don't get, they can't practice and all that stuff until Sunday morning. So, uh, and, we don't, and we can't get in here until uh, 10 o'clock, and it takes 45 minutes to an hour to set up and practice, get everything ready. So technically start at 1030, and as soon as we're in our own permanent building, it will start at 1030 on time. <laughs> yeah, we would pray at 1030. We do, they do pray over here in this other room at 1030 before service. We'd love to have you come back and be with us. So glad to have you tonight. Praise the Lord. Amen. And yes, Penny. Mm-hmm, okay. Uh -huh. And now are they seriously injured or just? No, that's, that's fine. The Lord knows who, who she is. Lord, we just pray. The, the tragedy and the, and the, uh, the, of, of loss of children is something we, we no, none of us ever want to experience. But Lord, we don't have words. We don't, there's nothing we can do in the natural that could bring, possibly bring comfort. But the great and mighty comforter, the Holy Ghost, can pour in the, the salve of comfort in the midst of the greatest tragedies. 
So, Lord, we don't know where they stand, what they believe. We just, but we do ask that old Spirit of God go. Overwhelm them with your presence. Comfort their broken hearts. I know their hearts are broken. Minister life into their hearts right now. We know those children are with you. So let the comfort of the Spirit be ministered to them right now and all the family members in Jesus' name. As only you can. And we certainly we can't, but we know you can. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What do you say to people in times like that? Sometimes there's nothing you can say. We it takes supernatural ministry from the Holy Ghost to be able to bind that broken heart. There are no natural words of comfort. But the Spirit can bring comfort. You know, Jesus said, I give you peace not as the world gives, which passes all understanding. His comfort passes understanding. Amen. All right. Thank you, Peter. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you again next time here at Faith and Victory Church. Until then, remember this, that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. God bless you. We love you. See you next time.